that picture of an Eskimo, smiley Eskimo. That's what we are. We laugh a lot. And I think it's a release. Life does go on. We go through a lot of hardship. But if, if you can laugh, then you're back to square one. And we do laugh a lot to the point where we pee in our pants. <laughs> Welcome to Bitch Talk. I'm Aaron Lim. This is Ange, a.k.a. Captain Party. And I'm producer Shar. And over the last 10 years, we've been elevating marginalized voices through interviews and events, sometimes over a glass of whiskey. Welcome to day nine of our Sundance and Slamdance Film Festival coverage. Today we're coming from Sundance, and we're talking about documentaries or episodics on indigenous women's issues. We have Twice Colonized and Murder in Bighorn. A big thank you to 48 Hills and our listeners for voting us Best of the Bay Best Podcast. And now, on with the show. Welcome back to the Festival Daily Buzz with the Bitch Talk Podcast. We are sitting down with a very powerful Sundance film called Twice Colonized, and we're speaking with the director, Lynn Aluna, and the subject of the film, Ayu Peter. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. We'll start with you, Lynn. Can you describe to our audience what your film is about? Oh, no, that's so difficult. (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) Take your time. (laughs) Well, it's about Ayu Peter, who's a... a lawyer and an activist who's been spending her entire life fighting for indigenous people's rights. And this film is a very personal story about how Ayu um, is fighting for a structural change in trying to ensure indigenous people a seat in European politics, while also uh, working to mend her own wounds and mm. the effects of colonization that she's living through. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, the work you do is so high level for indigenous people, but in this film, you were very vulnerable. Were there moments during filming that you wanted to pull the plug? Many times during that time, especially when I was tired and miserable, I just (laughs) wanted to run away from her (laughs) (laughs) and everything. And I... On hindsight, I was very unkind to her because I would take it out on Lynn. Mm. But now that it's all over, I, I'm grateful. But it was, it was hard during some days. Mm. Yeah. But it was great to be able to travel and to meet all those amazing people that I got to mm. meet. That was great. Yeah. It is. And we see a beautiful, It's not a character arc because it's your life, but when you mentioned seeing those people spending that time with the Inuit folks and then going back to Denmark and feeling a change within yourself, that was a really powerful thing to see. Yes, I felt the change. And when I was speaking Danish, I had vowed when I left when I was 18, I will never speak Danish again to the point where I even changed my name, my Danish name into Ayu, an Inuit name. So that was part of the healing. The travel itself and the filming was very healing for me. Mm -hmm. Um, I really appreciated a lot of the um, footage of Ayu dancing and jumping Mm. on the bed. Yes. And and playing bingo. And I, it was, it was great levity to such a serious story because I think it, it tells the story of you also need to play in your life. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about those choices and, and feeling comfortable being shot lap that way, Ayu? Well, as all of us, Ayu is a complex being. She doesn't just have one side. And I think more than anyone I know, Ayu, you are a person who, you have a black belt in karate. You <laughs> are a lawyer, an activist, a mother of five, and a seal skin designer, and so, so many things. And you have a great sense of humor. So editing the film it was uh, it was a challenge to find out which parts to include in the film because of course a portrait of a person is never the full person no mm-hmm. one will ever fully know what it is ayu have been through except for ayu so this is just a piece of that story and it was really important for me that people would uh, get a sense of of all that humor and energy and kindness that you're spreading in the world in the world while also having of course a lot of anger and things that you're dealing with because we think that's very unique and something that's for me is very inspiring 
I think it's very Inuit. If you if you look at Inuit, that picture of an Eskimo, smiley Eskimo. Mm-hmm. But that's what we are. We laugh a lot. And I think it's a release. Life does go on. We go through a lot of hardship. But if, if you can laugh, then you're back to square one. And mm-hmm. we do laugh a lot to the point where we pee in our pants. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't laughed. It's not funny. Wow, well, we have a lot in common. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I was in Hawaii. We were working on Microsoft, uh, t- turning it into Inutitude, mm-hmm. and we laughed so hard. <laughs> I peed, and then in my pants. And my oh. friend retelling the story when we went back to Iqaluit, she also peed in her pants, just <laughs> telling the story. So it's life is good when you can pee and laugh. Yeah. I, uh, completely, yeah. I've Deeper. I've debated buying diapers for certain events. <laughs> Just, you know, you know, just in case. Yeah. We would love to have a dance party sometime. I really, you could see just the release of all the tension and everything coming off your face when you're dancing. It's so beautiful. Um, But I did want to get into this twice colonized concept and what you would like for people to understand about what what the toll it takes on your everyday life and your everyday existence. And then Lynn, if you want to follow up with what you learned about, you know, the colonization of the mind through this project. You just live. When you're a child, you don't realize your life. You get up, you do things, your parents send you off, you do, you're placed in, in a dangerous environment and you don't understand what's happening. You just take everything on. It's like drinking water. If your water was poisoned, you didn't know and you're just drinking it. But over time, over decades, it turned out that even my mind would have been colonized. That you start questioning, why am I thinking like this? What's happening? But it's so slow and the process is so into every cell of your body. It's scary when you start realizing, oh, that's not right. Or that's not what is happening to me. It's a very long process of understanding that your whole mind uh, has been colonized as well. Mm -hmm. And that it's a painful process. It's hard to try to educate the mainstream, which is English and which is coming Mm -hmm. from a -hmm. Westminster law. Even the law, everything you do is dictated by outsiders who have imposed it. Mm -hmm. That becomes very difficult for us Inuit to try to function. How come we are so forgiving? How come we are so kind over and over and over again? How come you're not angry taking on animal animal rights groups? Why don't you employ those tactics that they have? So you have to be careful. Is it is it our way of being? What is our way of being? How do we conduct ourselves? And especially when the camera is on me, I have to present myself in a way that is from my indigenous community, that is the Inuit way of being in a world that is arms and just angry. Um, it becomes difficult, but I have to keep reminding myself what is our way of being? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, being a white Danish person, I didn't. There were so many things about my own country and myself that mm-hmm. I didn't realize before I actually met Ayu. We met by coincidence seven years ago, and that first meeting was uh, life changing for me. Really, um, sorry, it's an emotional day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Please, uh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just very grateful for for meeting you and for everything that you taught me. Sorry, just one. Oh, yeah. No problem. You're not going to make me cry. It's no, we're 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 we actually we love crying. Show. We love crying on this yeah, show. <laughs> At least our guests are crying this time with us. <laughs> Normally, it's just us. <laughs> oh, um, that first meeting. It was. I'm, I must sound really stupid, but I think a lot of us in. Denmark and Scandinavia and Europe, we have no idea. Mm -hmm. Um, We are in total denial and Mm -hmm. part of it is our education. Mm -hmm. We're not taught that we are colonizers. Um, And we grow up with this fake history about who we are, our part in the world. We're not confronted with um, 
these effects of colonization, what it's what it means today. We, we I think a lot of us think that colonization is something that happened in the past. It's done. Mm-hmm. It's not. <laughs> um, so uh, after uh, after meeting Ayu uh, that first time, I really felt uh, a big responsibility to find a way to share this knowledge that I was so lucky to to get. <laughs> At the time, I was still in film school, and we just kept in contact. And two years later, we started uh, uh, making the film together. Mm. And the very first time we filmed, there was uh, the scene in the film where uh, I was talking with her Danish friend, Asmus, about language and how it affects uh, affects you to mm. be speaking Danish. And that was just, just such a... Uh, eye-opening moment and there's been so many eye-opening moments like that for me personally and um, I'm still learning and mm-hmm. I really hope that when people watch this film that they they too will learn something new and that it will inspire them to try to make a difference. I really hope that this film will make a structural change because we do need a seat in the EU for uh, indigenous people. Mm-hmm. We do need um, to change things because European legislation affects indigenous lives. And I think that you show that so gracefully in the film, the importance of change. Mm-hmm. So I really hope that that's something that maybe this film can help support your work and push forward. Mm-hmm. Yes, ab- absolutely. And before we go, is there um, anywhere you want to direct people to Ayu to help be an ally in this fight other than watching the film and talking about the film? Um, we have set up a place where people can go and support. It's uh, twicecolonized.com. And there's different links to what, uh, where how people would like to support and get more information. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I mean, we are, we're all a work in progress, right, Lynn? Uh, thank you for your work and for, for teaching us so much about this movement. And, and we're happy to follow you anywhere you go. Ayu, you are really a hero. So again, we've been speaking with director Lynn Aluna and subject Ayu Peter of the incredible Sundance documentary, Twice Colonized. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. This episode is made possible by Anne Wang, Natalie Gamble, the Papa Lowdown Agency, the Friesen Family, Jenny Yang, Fleetwood, a.k.a. Nico, Melanie Pena, Lauren Lim, Catherine Tulio, Courtney Kita, Myla Blog, Anita Tabora Rodriguez, Arabella DeLuco, Chloe Jackman of Chloe Jackman Studios, Shauna Festi, Stephanie Walton, Lisa Shad, Antoinette Tabora, and Storied San Francisco. Thank you so much for donating, and a special shout out to the Slam Dance Film Festival for providing us a recording home in Park City. We're on the Festival Daily Buzz. My name is John Wildman. I'm the editor in chief of FilmsGoneWild.com. Here with my Bitch Talk teammates, Angela Tabora and Aaron Lim. On this segment, we're going to talk about a uh, an episodic uh, series that is uh, premiering here at Sundance, Murder in Bighorn. We have the directors, Roselle Benali and Matthew Galkin. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Thank okay. you. Uh, now, again, this is a, a series that you know, you know, film festivals have expanded their programming to include a project like this. Um, it makes it tough on people like us because normally a reviewer would watch one episode, but uh, with this I wanted to keep going and keep watching and keep watching um, because this is such an important uh, uh, subject that, that you two of you broach on this. Um, but one of you, please uh, introduce our audience to it. They have not seen this as yet. So introduce us to Murder in Bighorn. So Murder in Bighorn is a three-part doc series, and it investigates the possible murders and disappearances of a group of Native American women in rural Montana, specifically on the lame deer uh, Northern Cheyenne and in Crow Agency on the Crow Reservations. I want to get into obviously these disappearances, but I love how the film or the series really tackles. Um, if you want to address a problem, address its roots and the the creation of these reservations in the first place. Um, so can you talk about digging into the history of reservations and the long line of um, breaking of the Native American spirit? 
So growing up, I was born off the reservation, but both my parents both went to boarding school and grew up on the reservation. And so it was, I grew up knowing who I was, where my family came from. We would go back all throughout the year for different functions, whether it was funerals or celebrations. We were always going back and forth between the Pine Ridge Indian Reservations and the Navajo Reservation in Arizona. And so knowing the history through my parents' lens and taking upon myself to read books, watch as much as I can, um, documentary-wise when I was a young child. One of my favorite docs was uh, The Spirit of Crazy Horse that was on <laughs> PBS, and we had the videotape of it, and I would watch it pretty much once a week. <laughs> and it just, it's ingrained in you. And there's, no matter no matter where you come from, where you're born, where you live, there's this inherent sense of indigeneity that exists within you. And so now that I think about it when I'm older, I often wonder if that's generational trauma, if mm -hmm. that's my bloodline's memory of violence. And so I can't really speak too much from an outsider's perspective of our own history, but I can only speak to my own lived experience as a Native woman, um, a brown woman who has constantly known of the fears of going missing or being murdered. And so when we're talking about our series, Murder and Bighorn, mm. we really had to investigate um, the roots and we really wanted the greater audiences to understand that this isn't a single perpetrator, it's not a mystery, that this started with contact with European settlers mm. and the impacts of colonization is very much real and exists in our current generation. I'm going to speak for myself and not my colleagues here, but um, <clears throat> while I was watching the episodic, uh, there's something in me and a sick feeling in my stomach that maybe the local police could be involved in some way um, in most of the cases, just because the patterns were similar. Um, is that something that's discussed internally by the indigenous community at all? Or, or am I just going off the rails? I mean, we all have our own perception of what could be going on in our communities. I think a lot of us, because we do live in such small, tight-knit communities that it's hard to be public and say certain things. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so those conversations are had. And the reality is we just don't know. And we, we're constantly wondering why our cases aren't taken seriously, mm -hmm. aren't investigated, and why law enforcement is constantly so negligent. And, you know, it, it really makes me wonder... <clears throat> You know, if we're not getting proper justice, then who's to say that other places aren't getting proper justice? Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of link that I want to, I want people to sort of connect the dots. If it's happening to us, then it can very easily happen to other marginalized communities and beyond. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to start this question by praising uh, both of you for the skill with which um, different disparate aspects of storytelling are are utilized in here so well because you know again when you talk about the history you know we're um, our country we've got a uh, um, a conservative faction that doesn't want people to know the history that that you are laying out in here because they don't want something that'll make them feel bad and they should because that that history is heartbreaking um, when you know it and um, and then, you know the 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 the, the uh, neglect and of um, of uh, of brown women that disappear and uh, you know and are trafficked um, you know by uh, police authorities local authorities I mean that's well documented and yet still nothing's being done so so you have that and then on top of it you kind of have a procedural which of course that you know you know the, 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 Entertainment wise, everyone loves procedural. So you're balancing three aspects that you could make separate films on all three. And yet you've dovetailed them 
to show how they all intersect and what I would love for both of you to talk about, because that's not easy. And, and you did with this series <laughs> very, very well. So, so talk about the challenges of that and, and how you went about it. Um, so, I mean, the origins of this project is that Showtime, um, who is a network that I have a years long relationship with, brought this very general idea to me. Um, they were interested in exploring this crisis. Um, I didn't know anything about um, MMIW at all. I'm a non-native um, filmmaker. Um, I knew instantly that I needed to bring in a partner that was native um, to help me because, you know, I, I, I feel like I know how to make sort of large commercial documentaries, but I wanted this to be as authentic as possible. So I brought in Rizal and, you know, we kind of set out to make on its surface, a true crime doc series, uh, because, uh, but thinking of it more as a bait and switch than anything else. Uh, you know, I, we want people to watch this. We want this to reach the absolute widest audience possible. So to utilize the tropes of true crime documentaries, um, you know, so we set about, we had, we picked um, specific cases, uh, specifically in Bighorn County, because um, there is such a, a large concentration of missing and murdered cases. Um, these families that were, that uh, whose, whose daughters um, had either um, gone missing or been murdered were some of the sort of key families to start pushing for advocacy for this issue and sort of brought it to a national stage. Um, it was a lot through, you know, Henny Scott's case and case Sarah stops pretty places case and Selena, not afraid's case, their family members were incredibly vocal about this and really mm -hmm. brought it uh, to national attention. So <clears throat> in the sort of true crime vein, it, you know, it's challenging um, for us. We're not, we don't, it's not our job to solve crimes. That's not what we do. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, our job is to shine a light, tell these stories, um, raise awareness, uh, you know, make them as visible as possible. Um, so we, we can only take the, the true crime aspect of it so far, because there is, there has been no investigations into these mm -hmm. cases. We don't have access. You know, we have been pounding down the door of the Bighorn County Sheriff's mm -hmm. office for two years now. Mm -hmm. The FBI doesn't talk to us. The BIA doesn't talk to us. So um, there's only so far we can go. We can talk to everyone else that is involved or at least try to. Um, so, you know, look, if you're looking for a true crime payoff, this is not the series for you. But, you know, ultimately what was infinitely more important, uh, not that these, not that solving these cases isn't important, but for us, the crime with a capital C becomes the history. It's, it's so that you, you know, which is the balance we try to, to, um, to, to hold uh, for the series is, is you know, the, the historical reasons why all of these factors um, sort of coalesce into a perfect storm um, in these cases, why these women were put in such vulnerable situations to begin with. To expand also on what you're saying, Matthew, is, you know, we aren't, we aren't investigators. We're not trained police. We're not, you know, PI. We're just filmmakers. So all we can do sometimes, if, well, I should say this. It feels like sometimes all we can do is help elevate the visibility of these cases, um, these possible crimes, um, and really give the relatives and these families a voice and a platform about their loved one's case because so oftentimes they're just ignored and they're, they're screaming into a vacuum, frustrated, angry. Um, they're on the steps of the courthouses. They're advocating. They're putting themselves on the front lines because they want some sort of justice and we're looking for accountability. And, you know, um, we partnered with the NIWRC, mm -hmm. um, the National Indi Indigenous Women's Resource Center, um, specifically because, you know, it's almost like a baton pass. We can take this so far, but to have an organization that advocates um, for the families, that provides resources for Indigenous women, um, 
you know, we um, we can advocate, but it's by partnering with them, um, we raise the visibility of their organization. Um, so hopefully um, they can, you know, get this out even wider than Shift Time can. Well, again, like I said, you know, you're watching this, um, it's absolutely heartbreaking when, when, we, when we meet the families and, and it's infuriating every single shot of a, a police cruiser or the front of that office knowing that nobody's talking to you. Um, and then you, and then, then you get a letter from John Tester saying that he's upset or irritated. And you go, really? That's what we get. That's what we get after. Um, and yet again, your delivery system of, of, the, of the true crime aspect, like I said, is incredibly effective. Um, I hope, like I said, that Showtime's viewings uh, go up in a major way watching this this damn thing. <laughs> and uh, and like I said, congratulations on a really well done job. Thank you. Um, Thank again, you. Uh, we've been talking about Murder and Bighorn, a, uh, a three part doc series um, that is uh, premiering at Sundance. We've been talking to the directors, Roselle Benali and Matthew Galkin. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on today's show. You can find more information about this episode in our show notes. If you're missing us, you can visit us at bitchtalkpodcast.com to sign up for our newsletter and buy us a cup of coffee. Did you know we're also on the radio? You can find us at bff.fm. And lastly, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Only the coolest bitches are doing it. is a proud member of the BFF.FM podcast network. Learn more at podcast.bff.fm. BFF.FM, best frequencies forever.